hide and seeker. Normally you can't get near enough to these wary deer, but we meet one stag that refuses to budge. Off we go. Walkies. <laughs> oh, jeepers. Hot dogs. Dave Templar is honing, polishing a cocker spaniel ahead of a field trial. He explains what to work on. So I'm going to clean the window like that. The new RSPB president calls shooters subhuman. Deborah Hadfield looks at how bird watchers are using the politics of hate. We're giving away £140 worth of dog food from Hoddies. David is on the new stump. And James Marchington is back with this week's Hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Seeker are renowned as the toughest UK deer species to stalk. These are not native British deer. They're super wary, they have a habit of vanishing into thin air, and if you do get a shot, they're incredibly hard to knock down. Helen Tinner is blissfully unaware of all this as she sets out after a seeker stag with guide Nathan Whitehead. We're on an estate near Bigger in the Scottish borders, and Helen has brought her 308 Browning Exbolt with copper ammo. We're up early to be on the hill before dawn, Went out first light this morning, trying, trying to catch the uh, seeker coming back in off the hill and into the into the woods and forests. Helen isn't used to this type of stalking, and she's finding it tough going. It nearly killed me walking up that slope in the pitch black for like ten minutes. Managed to get over that, um, and then walking along up over the wall, through all the bracken, seeing seeing the seeker, and then them bouncing off again, and then going down slopes and trying to not kill yourself as you go in over boulders and... You can tell she's loving it, really. Meanwhile, Nathan is using all his skills to try to outwit the wary deer. Okay. Yeah, they're so secretive and really, really... I think the word is crepuscular, where they're not... You know, you wouldn't catch them out in the daytime. They're really first light and last light sort of creatures, you know. They'll, they'll go out on the hill, they're not bothered about getting wet. And, um, but yeah, they don't like daylight so much, <laughs> which yeah. just makes them hard to stalk. And again, the habitat they live in makes it all that more exciting. And I don't think there's a better species in the UK to stalk. They are, they're hard, but in a good way. You know? Yeah, the senses are, are, well, I don't know. I don't know another deer that's got the eyesight, the hearing. I don't know, they just, Unbelievable animals, really. They just go into nothing. They're... You'll see a couple walking across the side of a hill and try and cut them off, and you, just, you can't move fast enough. I don't even think you'd get round them in a car. You, you don't get an idea of the landscape, the size of the landscape, until you actually start walking the hills. And um, yeah, they're just, they're just a great deer to store. Even if you don't shoot one, it's good to be out and you get the scenery. And we saw a good few, just a matter of really good stags or hinds and calves or you know, the right animal didn't present. Then we did find one and it lay down. We stood for an hour, waited and waited and waited. What are you thinking might happen? I hope, what you hope it might happen? I'm hoping he'll do like a fallow would where he'll just stand up and have a look at us. Quite surprised, he's just tucked himself in there. You'd think he'd go in the thicker stuff. Hey! Ho! 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 And then in the end, I just walked into it. I got bored. <laughs> but we'll try and make something happen, and it got up and run off. But. Oh, yeah, it's more proved to myself that it was there and I wasn't seeing things. Five or six foot, I reckon, from it. Maybe ten foot. After that close encounter, we drop down into the plantation and make our way back towards the vehicle and a rest. <laughs> could you hear my heart beating? I was you could hear that. Could, could you hear my, my heavy breathing? I bet you could hear my heavy breathing. When we first started, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> yeah. I honestly thought, oh my God, I'm going to die, let's stop. Going out in the pitch black, though, that was quite funny. 
and you're like, mind the rocks. And I was like, what rocks? <laughs> <laughs> Right. It was just, um, yeah, and climbing over that wall as well. That was quite fun. Well, could be potentially quite dangerous. You got over all right. Got over that wall. Yeah. And then climbing through it. It, it. You just expect a dinosaur to pop out at some point, especially when we're coming through that bracken. It's so high, isn't it? And steep. Yeah, it's, a, it's a very different landscape. It, it's to just a shot. I mean, it'll take a while to process. A few hours later, we're back out for an evening stalk. It's Helen's last chance to shoot her seeker before she has to head back to England. Sort of reverse roles. You're waiting for the deer to come out of the woods, so you, you, we just got stood. Obviously, the three of us couldn't get into a box, so we got stood near where we've got a box set up, and um, yeah, it's got set up on the sticks there. We've got hinds coming out and back in again, feeding in and out through the wood. The pressure was on a bit, well, on Nathan, but we had to sort of just wait, and wait we did for a good while, didn't we? In that amazing forest, and I just thought, it's, it's going to happen, it's going to happen, but all the hinds were bouncing around us. And then the next minute I could see something coming in the thermal with a bit of, you know, a bit of urgency about it, and I just looked up, I was like, here we go, here we go, we're on. I've been so comfortable just waiting, and then at that point, of course, I couldn't find the the, the comfy position to shoot and I was like oh my goodness no this can't happen and, and I, I was just and Nathan was like move this way move that I was like can I lean against the tree and I, but what I was worried about was because I was moving I might have disturbed the, the seeker because they're so flighty yeah he played ball stopped broadside lovely at um, 150 yards and Helen sent one So I've managed to shoot it, which was good, good shot. But then it bounced off into the distance, and I was thinking, oh no, what's happened? Because at that point, I, although Nathan said it was a good shot, I wasn't that sure. I don't know what, what it is with Seeker, but they're well renowned for being um, hard, you know. But yeah, it must have gone 100 yards, and it was perfect. She cut the top of the heart off and smashed both lungs. So. You can't, uh, couldn't put the bullet in a better place. It just, that's what Seeker do. We went to where I thought the strike was and it was probably an extra 10 yards further back and we found a, a, a little lump of lung. They sort of seal up and I don't think they bleed out as fast as other deer. They, they've got a lot of fat on them and they seem to seal up. They don't bleed as fast. And that's, that's the only sort of reason I can see why they don't fall over as quick as other deer. But, um, yeah, we followed the, followed a bit of blood trail and he'd gone maybe a hundred yards. Finding it and but going through that wood is just so unbelievable. It's got its own vibe. It's just um, incredible f feeling in there. Off we go. Walkies. <laughs> oh jeepers. So all in all, it's been a 100% unbelievably memorable um, day. I'm delighted. You can find out about Browning Rifles at browning.eu or look for them on kitfinder.co.uk. And if you want to go stalking with Nathan, you can email him at the address below. Thank you, Helen and Nathan. Now, what is the Field Sports Nation getting as a prize this week? The draw is for bags of dog food from Hoddies. We have three prizes, a 12 kilogram bag of venison, a 12 kilogram bag of pheasant dog food for the winner and two runners up will get a venison and a pheasant handy pack. This is the excellent idea of complete dog food produced with wild British game and anyone can get a free trial pack on the Hoddies website. Visit bit.ly slash Hoddies dog food. Find out how to enter the competition on the Field Sports Nation's own TV show Field Sports Extra which is out on Tuesdays and you can watch that TV show by joining them for a fiver a month. Link to that below. Now to the weekly kibble that is David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Magistrates have fined a huntmaster after he failed to call off hounds when they disturbed a fox. 
Daniel Cherryman was in charge of the South Shropshire hunt on National Trust land when the hounds caught the scent of an animal. The court heard the fox was not killed. Antees filmed the incident. The 37-year-old pleaded guilty to hunting a wild mammal with dogs, contrary to the Hunting Act 2004. Telford Magistrates Court heard Mr Cherryman would likely be subjected to adverse comments for weeks, months and probably years from Sabs who would rejoice in his guilty plea. The verdict is a significant step up for the power of Tony Blair's hunting ban, putting it in line with the Badger Act, which makes disturbance a crime. Magistrates fined the master of foxhounds £607 plus £135 in court costs. A farmer fighting a court case over environmental damage is holding a unique sale of the century of farm machinery to raise funds. John Price from Herefordshire has to fight the case over tree removal on a riverbank. Whereas most farmers receive grants to clear undergrowth and bankside trees from rivers, the Environment Agency and Natural England have been investigating Mr Price over alleged damage to the River Lug in a high-profile case that ended up in court. Mr Price claims the EA encouraged him to undertake the work. Mr Price is due back in court in April 2023. An English police force ordered a country-wide dispersal order after multiple cases of hair poaching. The order gives police the right to tell people to move away from the area or face arrest. Lincolnshire Police says many of the suspects involved are from outside the area and often linked to organised crime groups. New laws introduced in August 2022 means catching hares with dogs carries an unlimited fine and up to six months in prison. Police say culprits will be arrested, prosecuted and their vehicles and dogs will be seized. Crimes such as fly tipping, livestock rustling and poaching are a top priority for rural communities. That's according to the Countryside Alliance as it conducts its annual rural crime survey. Almost half of the people who took part in last year's poll said they did not think police take rural crime seriously. One in four told the survey they don't even bother reporting crime. Link to the survey below. Antis have won a campaign to ban meat at a Scottish university. The Students' Union at Stirling University held a meeting of 100 activists which voted to transition to 100% vegetarian catering by 2025 for all 17,000 students on site. The plant-based university's campaign is run by Antis group Animal Rebellion, a splinter group of Extinction Rebellion. The group seeks to target other universities across the UK. In 2020, the University of Edinburgh rejected a similar proposal. 58% of 6,000 votes cast said no to a a meat ban, despite the students' union narrowly passing it before the larger vote. Field Sports Channel is sad to report the death of Dennis Stepney. The gunsmith and gun shop owner from UK Gun Repairs in Somerset was a friendly face on Field Sports Britain, commenting clearly and accurately on issues faced by UK gun shops. He died aged 69 after a long battle with cancer. TV presenter Chris Packham has announced the postponement of a walk to protest against hunting and shooting. He posted on the website of the People's Walk for Wildlife that the event planned for the 26th of November 2022 will take place in the spring. He blames the train strike on the change. He also claims it might be too expensive for people at this time. The 2018 People's Walk for Wildlife attracted just a few hundred. And Packham's last London march, calling on the Queen to order the rewilding of the Crown Estate, attracted only dozens of people, most of them children from the same school. The Gamekeepers Welfare Trust is offering a new scheme to give extra help. It's setting up clinics to give consultations directly with nurses. The GWT offers support to gamekeepers, stalkers, gillies, students and their families. The new health and wellbeing clinics are operating on Monday mornings and Wednesday evenings. People can chat online via a video call to discuss worries or concerns they have. Anyone who struggles with technology can get a call back. With a cost of living crisis and the UK officially in a recession, the GWT wants to make sure people have someone to talk to. We know that it's so difficult to get appointments. The NHS are overstretched now. And sometimes it's a very long way to get to a doctor's surgery or any support that you can access. Very often something happens out of hours or at weekends so we have designed this so that it's Monday morning and Wednesday evening. Rising oil prices are causing hardships for rural communities in the UK. 
The Countryside Alliance says more needs to be done to help families cope with the increases as they're worrying about heating their homes this winter. In his autumn statement, the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt doubled the payment for people using alternative fuels like oil to £200. The Countryside Alliance says 52.6% of rural homes are off the gas grid, compared to just 9.8% of urban properties. David Bean of the Countryside Alliance says the government needs to offer much more help. Other things that the government should be considering doing uh, would include an urgent VAT cut on all fuel sources, and also looking to work with the providers of these alternative fuels to allow people to have better opportunities to spread the costs over time. Because if you're filling up uh, an oil tank, if you have to do that, if that's what you're reliant on, then that is a one-off cost. And with those costs having increased, it is exceedingly difficult for many of those people to meet them. Hunting, shooting and conservation organisations in South Africa have joined forces to help protect wildlife. The National People and Parks Community Association and the African Community Conservationists have signed a Memorandum of Understanding. It commits them to a strategic partnership to boost wildlife programmes. The National Hunting and Shooting Association and the Professional Hunters Association of South Africa also signed the agreement. The partnership commits the government to supporting hunting for conservation. An anti that took to Twitter claiming that Zambia was about to ban hunting has been smacked down. Sue Spurgeon shared a claim that the Zambian government was poised to announce a ban on game hunting in preference for photo tourism. The country's tourism minister, Rodney Melindi Sukumba, tweeted back saying, our support for hunting has not changed. Photo tourism isn't a replacement for the sustainable use of wildlife through hunting. He followed this up with the message, don't take it from me, Sue, I just run Zambia's Ministry of Tourism. Robbie Kruger of Blood Origins says the original tweet was likely connected to the campaign to ban and trophy hunting. Her idea that Zambia is converting to the new Kenya is absolutely false and trophy hunting is a pillar, a pillar of wildlife conservation and sustainable use in Zambia. And finally, a British angler has wowed the angling community across the world after he caught a 70 pound goldfish. Andy Hackett, who's 42, was at Blue Water Lakes in the Champagne region of France when he reeled in the giant orange fish, which could be the world's largest. The fish is not a true goldfish, but a hybrid species of leather carp and koi carp, which are ornamental fish commonly found in ponds. You are now up to date with Phil Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Buying shooting kits? Then head to Kit Finder, and our team will help you find the right product at a fair price from dealers all over the UK. Kit Finder, the shooting kit comparison website. Thank you, David. Next, I went out with Dave the Dog Templar, who's getting his Spaniel field trial ready. It really couldn't go better on this dog training outing. We walk into a wood on the Neston Park shoot near Bath in Somerset. Dave's dog puts up a bird. Gamekeeper Seb Abbott shoots it. Dave's dog retrieves it. I basically scored a goal, right? And in a competition, you have sort of 50 metres or maybe sometimes 20 minutes. When I walk into here, I'm only going to run for that short distance and then the next person is going to come on and then the next person is going to come on. Well, if I get what I've just had now, which is to get a flush and retrieve straight away, then I'm marked up. Dave's talking like this because he's training the Spaniel for field trials, which is not quite the same as training it for a shoot day. When you go and beat in, we'd have carried on for the other dog, it'd be a lot calmer, it'd only go in a bush where it thinks there's a pheasant. Unfortunately, from a trial point of view, everything has to be judged very, very quickly. So it's going to be judged within something like 15 minutes, actually nearly straight away, just looking at the style and the action in the dog, the way it works, its head's down, the cover, it goes straight in, it flushes and it sits up... To automatically and then when I sent it it's straight out and straight back. That's the difference between trialling and getting your dog to put up pheasants. The point of trialling is to mark a dog on all the best aspects of its breed while it's working. The only thing this dog can do that you cannot do is use your nose okay so that dog should be able to work either side of me so it works within gunshot the rules in the kennel club rules are it covers the gun. So if you've got a gun either side of you, it should work to the gun and find in any piece of game, 
if the bird got up behind it, I'm out. It's a bit like cleaning windows. Okay, you've given me a piece of window to work, which is a piece of cover in between two guns. So I'm going to clean the windows like that. Hopefully when the wind's blowing, you're going to have the wind coming this way. Or if it, the wind comes that way, I'm going to go that way and clean the windows. Okay, so I've got to cover all this ground or be seen to cover all this ground. So with my dog, when I ask it to go in a piece of cover, it will do that. Come back and then it come across and do that little bit. And then come across and do that bit. So I'm cleaning the windows, basically making sure there's not a pheasant within this ground. All right, that's the, the basic. So you can say to me, you have not passed any piece of game and you look like you've hit every piece of cover that possibly might have a bird in it. Not to walk down here and say, there's nothing in there. Got it. All right. What I'm actually going to do is prove to the judge and to the viewer, in a sense, that when I go like that, it's definitely had a look. Okay, rather than just running up and down and waiting to find a bump into something. The retrieve was perfect. How much does Dave reward his dogs for picking game correctly? The dog itself has always been rewarded for retrieving. It likes retrieving. It's a bit like me and you. If I said to you, there's a £50 note in that bush, you'd only have to find two, and every time I go like that and you find a £50 note, you'll say, David, point me again, where would you like me? But if I stand in this wood and I say, in this wood there's £50, and it takes you four hours to find it, it's nothing to do with David. Do it. Okay. So if I go like that in early stages and it finds a tennis ball, great fun. £50 note comes over, another £50 note over there. So I'm rewarding it very, very quickly. If you want help or advice on getting your dog to this standard, contact Dave through his website, countrywaysgundogs.com. Thanks, Dave. Now, the RSPB has increased its attacks on shooting. News correspondent Deborah Hadfield looks at what the Bird Rights Organisation is doing and why. Fact or fiction? That's the question that many shooters are now asking about the way the RSPB represents the UK countryside. Talking to Charlie at the 2022 Game Fair, Duncan or Ewing of the RSPB was outspoken about the brood management scheme for hen harriers. On hen harriers, I think uh, Ian has put rather a glossy spin on that one. I mean, again, evidence that has been, to be honest, largely ignored by GWCT, and again, it's published peer-reviewed information, is that quite a lot of these brood manage, managed hen harriers that uh, are being, uh, uh, you know, uh, fed and then uh, released on, on near grouse moors are actually ending up being shot, you know, so... Well, hang so on, that, that, is, that is a very, very... What do you mean they end up being shot? Have you got any evidence for that? Yeah, there's a peer-reviewed paper, Murgatroyd et al., uh, which shows the fate of uh, English hen harriers, from, which includes uh, birds. This is satellite tag birds. Landowner groups and shooting organisations are horrified. Duncan references a scientific paper which actually was produced before the brood management scheme. It perhaps he's hoping that nobody would read it. So this narrative that the RSPB have that, that any bird that is released will just simply be shot is just repeated without any evidence. And so they will tell you that the failure of hen harriers to breed at Geltsdale is because when they breed, as soon as they fly over the boundary, the gamekeepers will kill them. And then when you point out, well, ha have you presumably, that's a very strong accusation, presumably you've witnessed that, and if you've witnessed it, you have informed the police. At which point they go utterly silent, as if no one's ever pointed this out. It's very easy to make general sweeping comments about illegal activity. And in response to him, look at the success of the hen harriers in England over the last few years. What will happen with the RSPB is they'll become more a campaigning, politicising type body than they already are, and they will disengage themselves from people who shoot. And we have access to two thirds of the, the rural landscape, that's what we estimate. We have relationships with landowners, and more importantly, those landowners in the wider scheme of things, with and without shooting interests, will start seeing the RSPB moving away from somebody they think they could trust and work with. And I rather fear they're going to effectively cut off their nose to spite their face by continuing to go down this particular line. It's not just lies, it's hate speech. The RSPB released a report on bird crime in November 2022, which tried to show that gamekeepers are systematically killing birds of prey. It claims one incident of raptor persecution in Northern Ireland, which it says 
is the tip of the iceberg. There's a success story here that we've got it driven down to one incident. Any bird persecution should be condemned. This is through the work of the stakeholders and not the RSPB. So I'm quite miffed by, by, by their comments. But if you stand back and look at what the RSPB are doing, they are, they are using this and a combination of other elements which I'll come on to, I think to, it appears increasingly to instill and inspire hostility from the public towards those that are involved in game management. It extends to reporting on uh, bird crime, which the RSPB used to report when it started doing it in the early 90s. It covered all bird crime. Now it prioritises just raptors, and within that, really, it just prioritises talking about gamekeepers. It's a bit like asking people to report if they happen to be on the M1 and they see a red car, can you let me know about it? And then the next year you produce a report saying 90% of cars on the roads in England are red. Well, that's not really the case. What they're doing is they're asking people to report suspected incidents and they're reporting on suspected incidents and saying that they are confirmed, but suggesting that police have confirmed them, but actually they haven't, they just the RSPB have confirmed them themselves and so nobody actually sees any of this data. The RSPB is doing well for national lottery and taxpayers' cash in Northern Ireland. It won four and a half million pounds for a contract to remove rats from Rathlin Island off the coast of Antrim. Gamekeepers are the group's main commercial competition. The island size is about 3,000 acres, working out at about £1,500 per acre to achieve this aim. And really the question has to be asked is, is this a good use of money? Would a private contractor charge as much? And again, if they worked with organisations such as Countryside Alliance and the other country sports organisations, would our members um, be willing to assist? The fact that this 4.5 million, some of that will have come from taxpayers' money at this time, just really shocks us and really begs the question of, of, of is this the best way to spend taxpayers' money? Some of the RSPB's monstering of gamekeepers is subtle and could be interpreted several ways. A tweet by its new president, shortly before he took office, is clear. Dr Amir Khan tweeted that shooting birds just for pleasure doesn't make you more of a man, woman or person, but it does make you less of a human being. I think like everybody else, I think we're thinking, here we go again. You've got a president, you've got a vice president, busy saying things which openly attack the field sports community and the RSPB is making no attempt to distance itself from their comments and you have to assume that they, they support them. It's really disappointing to see people make ill-judged comments and as somebody who shoots, I don't particularly like reading that. And it does make you wonder what goes into the top level of the RSPB. And it, you, know, you have some sympathy with people who then wonder why they come out with some of the policy positions they do when they don't really respect the evidence properly. We approached the RSPB for an interview or a comment on these issues. They didn't respond. For the whole of the Game Fair Theatre discussion, between Charlie, Ian Coghill and Duncan or Ewing, follow the link below. Thanks to all who took part in that. And you can read Deborah's article on this, which goes alongside the film, link below. Now from Kit to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube. James Marchington has the top hunting and shooting videos this week in Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Here's a lovely one from Cap and Ball. He loads his own paper case cartridges with black powder and takes an antique hammer gun on a walked up partridge day in Hungary. Pheasants Forever is on its annual rooster road trip, highlighting the fact that anyone in the States can hunt game birds on public land. Thanks to Mark Corney for sending in that one. Back home in the UK, Andy Crow is out shooting pigeons over stubble with grandson Regan and cousin Gary in this video from Jack Pike. Corvid Hunter takes his mate Beefy to help him protect an ancient woodland from damage by grey squirrels. Plenty of shooting action and some great wildlife footage too. Knife maker Alan from Danem Outdoors is out in Scotland on the first day of the road 
judo season and gets the chance to demonstrate a grullock with one of his knives. At the other end of the UK, members of the Capriolus Club are on Exmoor, stalking huge West Country red stags. Thanks to Peter Jones for sending in that one. Meanwhile, in Africa, East Cape bushveld hunting are after Oribe, the largest of the so-called Tiny Ten African antelopes. Finally, Predator Protection UK isn't happy just reading factory ammo data sheets. He does his own in-depth testing to find out how accurate they really are. The results may surprise you. That's it for this week. We've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email Charlie the link, charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. And that's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube. Best of all, pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain. It's at 7pm UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing and goodbye. <laughs>